I think we can make a start and then other participants will will come in uh, for sure as well. So a very warm welcome to all of you from a very misty Ostend uh, where the eModnet Secretariat is based on the Belgian North Sea coast. Uh, my name is Kate Larkin. I'm the moderator for this webinar. I'm the head of secretariat for the European Marine Observation and Data Network, eModnet. And this is a very large network of 120 partners across Europe delivering the EC Marine Data Service which is funded by DG Mare. Um, I'm here today with a number of Secretariat colleagues, Angelica, Megan, Connor, um, but also together with many eModnet coordinators and experts from the thematics and data ingestion. Um, I'm just gonna say a few words to set the scene uh, so that we can uh, kick off. Um, at the end of last year at the eModnet Open Conference 2023, the eModnet community launched a call to action. And this calls upon the wider marine and maritime community to really work um, and further engage with eModnet. And this included a specific call to the European uh, marine and maritime community, including um, the research and innovation community, of course, to really um, in enhance and, and increase the sharing of the in situ marine data and data products that you are producing and collecting within your projects and to share them with eModnet as a long-term EC marine data service. And then also on the other side to really fully utilize eModnet, um, the service that offers a very broad selection of in situ pan-European uh, data and data products in the marine environment and human activities. And to really use this marine knowledge to underpin your uh, Horizon Europe and EU mission, uh, restore our ocean and waters uh, projects and research and innovation. Um, so building on this, the aim of this eModnet webinar today is to really bring together the European research and innovation projects related to the marine domain, particularly those who are may, may be less aware of eModnet uh, up to now, and to provide information and guidance to all of you on the eModnet service, on the processes of the pathways to submit your data to eModnet, and how to get the best value out of, of eModnet itself. Uh, the webinar has been organized with co-organized together with the eModnet Secretariat, uh, Data Ingestion, uh, eModnet Thematics, in collaboration with ECDG Mare and Sinea. Um, we have 101 registrations representing 45 um, European projects here today. And this is based on a, an, an invitation only. Um, so you will have all received invitations or given your motivation to join today. So we're really looking forward to your uh, comments and exchanges. Um, this uh, webinar is being recorded. You will have seen that as you came into the webinar. So please keep your uh, video and, and audio off if you prefer. Um, but we're recording it because we would really like to make it available as a resource uh, to the wider uh, community after the event. We will also be using a number of um, other features. So if we can go to the housekeeping rules, please, I can just take you through those. So feel free to update your participant name in Zoom with your uh, name, maybe the EU project you're representing or your organization. Keep your video and audio turned off as default, but when we get to the Q&A sessions, we will enable your video and, and audio so that you can interact, of course, um, during those times. Um, for the questions you may have, please use Slido for your content questions. Um, and we will be going to Slido at the Q&As to see um, the number of questions there. And we'll also use that for polling. But if you would like to use the Zoom chat, um, you can introduce yourself there. Um, you can say what's motivating you to come to this webinar, what you want to get out of the webinar, perhaps. Um, and uh, if you have any technical issues or questions. Um, you can also use the raise hand feature when we come to the Q&A sessions, if you would like a particular uh, verbal intervention. Um, and then please wait for myself as moderator to invite you to unmute. Um, and then, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, we are recording this, this webinar. Um, so by joining this, you've given your consent to being recorded, but of course you can choose to keep your video and audio off. So without further ado now, I'd like to pass to uh, Zoe Constantinou from DG Mare to give an opening uh, address. So please, over to you, Zoe. Thank you, Kate, and thank you, thank you to all the participants that joined us today, and to all the eModnet colleagues uh, that have organized and are participating to this uh, very crucial webinar. Uh, we are here today to bridge a gap where this gap exists. Uh, the European Commission makes a very substantial investment in marine research and innovation, an investment that has great value and that it needs to be provided uh, with adequate legacy. 
in the recent years, the European Commission is aiming through multiple efforts to consolidate marine knowledge and make it available for as many users as possible. Uh, for researchers, but, but the researchers, but also beyond uh, researchers, for policymakers, uh, for blue economy users, uh, for society. Uh, you have been invited to this webinar as coordinators or key participants of European projects, uh, which either under Horizon Europe or the Mission Ocean uh, collect marine in situ data. Uh, this data is a very crucial part of the European investment, and it's very important that it becomes openly available to all to, uh, to maximize the added value and ensure its legacy for future uses. It is part of your obligation as project uh, coordinators and participants to make this data openly available and to have as part of your project a robust data management plan. On the other hand, Emotnet for almost 15 years now has the role of aggregating and standardizing, harmonizing marine in situ data and making them openly available on a pan-European scale. Emotnet uh, is currently the established marine in situ data service of the European Commission. And that uh, means that its sustainability is guaranteed by us, by the Commission. Uh, as a key component of many of our uh, political priorities that are related to the marine environment. Uh, it is the place where the in-situ data from your project should flow uh, in a findable, accessible, interoperable uh, and reusable manner. Uh, the purpose of today's webinar is to give a glimpse of the Emotnet service to those of you that are not uh, aware of it uh, or very familiar with it and most particularly the part of the Emotnet ingestion service and how it can support the flow of your data to Emotnet. Now it's important to underline that we are not here to change things that already work well. Uh, there are many projects uh, amongst you that are already have established relationships uh, with the Emotnet thematic plots uh, through co-fertilization co co with, with our um, uh, partner organizations in Emotnet. And thus, part of your data is already uh, flowing into Emotnet with no issue. Uh, there is no reason to change things that are already established and are working uh, in, in a good manner. Uh, there is probably uh, an opportunity for others to learn from your experience. Uh, but at the same time, we are here to provide you also with alternatives uh, in the ones that you don't have this kind of flows of data towards Emotnet uh, through uh, um, uh, giving you more information on the service and particularly uh, through showing you what the ingestion service uh, can do for you. Uh, the, the responsibility for the development of the data management plans and the submission of data uh, remains with uh, you as European projects under Horizon Europe or the Mission Ocean. Uh, but at the same time, Emotnet can provide support in how to better develop these data uh, management plans and how to establish the flows towards Emotnet. And this is what we want to do um, here today. And this is what my Emotnet colleagues are going to demonstrate uh, soon. Uh, from the point of view of the European Commission, uh, our hope is that efforts like this can create the foundation for more consolidated marine knowledge in Europe now and in the future. So, for instance, we hope that this knowledge is going to be uh, replicated also to the future projects that we're going, <laughs> you're going to submit and that are going to be uh, approved. Uh, it is very important that marine data should be openly available for use, especially when the, the funding for this marine data comes from uh, European resources. Uh, and um, it is very important that it's openly available for every use and available for development of other applications and digital applications and services, as for instance, the ones that we want to provide through the European Digital Twin of the Ocean. Uh, the idea is that uh, this added value can, 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 can be used for uh, common interest uh, but also for the development of private applications and the cases that the blue economy requires it. Uh, and with this, I will thank you again for the participation. I hope that uh, Emotnet is in a position to, uh, to provide robust collaborations with uh, the European Research and Innovation uh, Projects. Uh, and good luck, colleagues.
Thank you very much, Zoe. I see now that we have more than 90 people on the line, which is great. So thank you very much for your interest. We hope today will be very informative. And as Zoe was mentioning, really sets the scene for more, more dialogue and, and collaboration with research and innovation projects. Um, could we please go back actually to the agenda because I've, I did not yet uh, give you the nutshell overview. So we've just had the opening address. We're gonna do a quick icebreaker um, with Slido polling, which will pop up in a minute on your screen. And then my, my colleague Connor and I will give um, a short overview of eModnet in a nutshell. Then we'll pause for a 10 minute Q&A on eModnet. Um, and then we'll launch into a few presentations, <clears throat> excuse me, which are focused on uh, the eModnet data ingestion and data submission processes, the context in the wider uh, European marine data management community, and some examples from eModnet thematics um, on the types of data flows. So, and then some, some questions and answers as well. So now we can move to the icebreaker poll. So the first question, you'll see the Slido QR code on the left-hand side that you can scan, or you can join Slido and use the code, the hashtag code that's on the screen. Uh, and the question is, which EU project are you representing today? This is going to be a word cloud, so please use just the acronym of the project or one or two words um, in order to create uh, the word cloud. So we'll keep this open um, for 30 seconds or so whilst people are entering their projects and we'll start seeing the projects coming up. And just a, a reminder, as this is happening today, um, in my opening, I was mentioning that uh, we have over 90 people registered uh, for this uh, webinar and 45 European projects uh, are normally being represented here based upon the registration pages. There could well be more, of course. Um, and we have a lot of eModnet experts here from the ingestion, uh, thematics, secretariat and central portal. Okay, so last 10 seconds or so, get your uh, names of your projects into Slido if you can. Okay, great. So you can see a huge array of different uh, projects also um, different topics or domains, uh, different experts of eModnet up on the screen. So we have a great diversity here today. Um, so we look forward to hearing more from you in the, in the discussion sections. Great, let's move to the next uh, poll now, please. So this is just to gauge a little bit um, everyone's familiarity with eModnet. Um, it's not a trick question. Please answer just as honestly as you can so we can get a picture of um, how aware you are of eModnet, if you already use eModnet or not yet, perhaps. Um, it's very useful to us to know for gauging the, the discussion. Fantastic. So it's looking like over 80% are aware of, of you are aware of eModnet at least and over 40% um, have not yet used eModnet but hopefully this presentation will give you more information on that and over 40% of you are using eModnet already which is great. Okay so I think we'll move on now to the first presentation. Uh, just a reminder of the Slido. So as we kick off the first presentation before the Q&A, you can use Slido also to add your particular questions. This first Q&A will focus on more um, eModnet wide questions. So if you have a particular question on the service as a whole, um, please add them into Slido now. And then later we will collect questions uh, relating to data ingestion. Uh, and so for this presentation now, uh, myself and my colleague Connor will give a short overview of eModnet in a nutshell and give a couple of examples of how European RNI projects are already using eModnet. So next slide, please. So just in, in a nutshell, uh, eModnet, the European Marine Observation and Data Network is an EC marine data service 
Um, it's established uh, by the European Commission more than 15 years ago, um, and it's become a European authority in regional best practice in the marine data domain. It specializes in the in situ data, so all of the ocean observations, marine monitoring that are in water collected or around the water. So it can Im involve, of course, the seabed and below, but also the air just above um, the water, but it's really in situ data collections. And it's a flagship initiative of uh, DG Mare. Uh, Imodnet is delivered by a network of over 120 leading organizations across Europe that work together in collaboration with national, regional and European marine data management initiatives. And you'll hear more uh, of that later on. Um, and important to say that uh, Emodnet is a key marine knowledge initiative and one of the two EC marine data services. So it works very closely with Copernicus Marine Service, um, which is uh, through DG DEFIS of the European Commission. And together, Emodnet and Copernicus uh, are providing the backbone for the European marine data space and the European digital twin ocean. Also, um, a key contributor to global initiatives, uh, with Emodnet being harvested by global uh, ocean data frameworks. Okay, next slide, please. And click again. Great. So in terms of the added value of Emodnet, Emodnet has um, many different uh, sort of assets and, and added value, but if we just pick out two key assets, um, you have the trusted fair pan-European data layers that Emodnet um, provides. And this is based on existing data that has been collected by uh, the, the wider marine and marine knowledge uh, community and then shared with Emodnet so that it can be um, fair. Um, and then it's brought together into these pan-European uh, data layers. And these are high resolution as possible and are um, standardized and harmonized, which is really a, a sort of unique uh, offer in Europe because they also come with the associated metadata uh, as well. And then on top of that, Emodnet experts produce data products which can be you know, anything from composite maps to digital terrain models for bathymetry, et cetera. Um, and these are also um, quite generic, but they are a baseline, high resolution, high quality data product that can be then used um, for any application, whether it's research and innovation or others. And the idea being that there's a huge capability in Europe for ocean observing data collection. And the idea is to bring all of those data together um, so that they're not just used once for a single purpose, but then harmonized and standardized so that they can be used many times and that we progressively build a, a much higher resolution uh, understanding and, and, and data layers of the European seas and beyond, which of course reduces uncertainty, but it also um, is more efficient. It saves businesses um, money. Uh, it also can direct research and innovation campaigns because if you have the baseline knowledge of an area, you can target any new data collection efforts on the, the gaps that exist. Um, which are more possible to know, um, and stimulating innovation as well. So next slide, please. So for this, this is on the screen, the Emodnet uh, service as it stands today. So almost, well, just over a year ago, in fact, Emodnet released its um, fully unified service. Um, so we have a, the portal now, which you can then access um, all of the different thematics in one place. And I'm going to pass to my colleague, Connor, to take you through some of these fun features and functionalities. Uh, thanks, Kate. Can you hear me OK? Yes, we can. Yes. Uh, ha hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining today. I'm just going to give four quick slides to give you an overview of uh, where we are. Um, prior to 2023, eModnet uh, as a project existed as seven separate portals uh, for each of the thematics. and. Um, each of those separate portals had different ways of sharing data and discovering data and downloading data. And we decided, or it was decided that we needed to provide a new uh, uh, interface to the world, unifying the portals into one central portal to make it easier for people to access the eModnet products. We wanted to, to, to reduce the distractions to those products that was caused by having many different portals. So um, we um, launched this in January 2023, and uh, it's been going for a year now. It's been very successful. And as part of the centralization, uh, we centralized the information that was accept what, that was on all the separate portals. Uh, we, central we created one single map viewer. We've got one single catalog now containing all the products from eModnet. And we, we launched a new service uh, called uh, a central uh, AirDAP server for, for serving out the uh, 
grid data sets that are on emotnet. So all the old portals were then shut down, uh, but the data services that they provide in the background are still um, alive and well. Uh, next slide, please. So we're striving co to, uh, uh, for consistency across the thematics in terms of metadata, file formats, download APIs, and web services. And this is, happens in the background. But to the user, the biggest change would have been how, how eModNet looked. And that was um, mainly due uh, to, or primarily due to the um, to the fact that we moved to the European Commission uh, domain. Uh, eModNet is now a service of DG Mare. And because of that, we have to comply with all the design language of the European Commission. So if those of you who remember the old eModNet website would have remembered lots and lots of yellow, and now we're very much very blue everywhere. Um, so next slide, please. So then we have an essential map viewer uh, where we have all the, the main eModNet products, the ones that are uh, the flagship products, so to speak. And we work very hard to provide a unified and consistent way for users to uh, find the, the eModNet products, subset eModNet products, and download eModNet products from the map viewer. Um, and on, on the right-hand side there, you have a situation where we have products from human activities and products from bathymetry, uh, both being displayed on the on the map viewer. And you, in, if you, I invite you to go and experiment with eModNet yourself, you can actually draw a box on the map and subset those two data sets for a region of interest. Uh, next slide there, please. So we also made very conscious decision to, to build a very loosely coupled uh, infrastructure. So what I mean by this is if you go to the, when you go to the eModNet uh, website, you'll see in the very first, uh, at the top of the page, the links to the map viewer, the data products catalog, and the AirDAP server. All these exist uh, by themselves, but they also interact with each other to provide the services in the map viewer. So if you go to the map viewer, you can download data products, which are downloading them in the background from either the catalog or the AirDAP server. So once you are from, once a person is familiar with the system, they can go straight to the products catalog or they can go straight to the AirDAP server. So what we're trying to do is provide multiple channels uh, of access for users to the eModNet products in order to meet the different um, skill levels of the type of people who want to use our eModNet products. Next slide there, please. So just to give you an illustration, we have a very rich metadata on the uh, on our catalog service. Uh, we have a GeoNetwork catalog service, and you can search the catalog for the, uh, many of the different products. And we also make sure to, to where we can to provide information within the metadata on how to on how the data can be down, directly downloaded, having just having the information within the metadata. Uh, next slide, there, please. So we also very much focused on using standards such as Open Geospatial Consortium web services standards to make the for publishing the data uh, and data products, and also how we on, on uh, focused on standards for catalog services, which meant that for the first time uh, in this late twenty twenty three, the eModNet catalog was was harvestable by the Group on Earth Observations System Assistance Portal and by the new ocean data information system uh, hub from IODE. So you can also access and find all eModNet products on, on both of these systems. Uh, and on the GEOS portal, because we populated the uh, download information in the metadata, you can also download the data uh, products from the GEOS portal or interact with them in the GEOS map viewer. So we're very much focused on making sure that the products that come from the eMod network, network and, and anybody who submits data through the eMod net, network reach a, a, a wide as, a audience as possible in a, a, in a straightforward manner as possible. So I invite you to go and try out the, the, the eMod net portal yourself and feel free to contact us if you have any questions. Uh, thank you. Great, thank you very much, Connor. So now we're going to play a very short two and a half minute animation video to explain eMod net in a nutshell. Are you feeling like a lost fish in the vast ocean of marine data? Are you tired of swimming in circles, trying to find the right information? Fear not. 
because the unified EmoNet portal is here to rescue you from the depths of data despair. But what is EmoNet, you ask? We are the European Marine Observation and Data Network, an EU marine service for marine in situ data from a vast network of data providers from Europe and beyond. We assemble and process these data and make them available to you all for free. And we're not talking about just any data. We're talking about the good stuff, the kind of data that will make your research sing your business boom, and be the bedrock of your marine planning and environmental assessments. No matter what you're looking for, seafloor structure, marine litter, coastal erosion, waves and currents, wind farm sites, underwater noise, or even the holiday plans of our underwater friends, eModnet has got you covered. We've got data on everything from bathymetry to biodiversity, from ocean physics to seafloor geology and from water quality to seabed habitats and human activities at sea. And the best part, you can easily discover, visualize, and download marine data and data products using our user-friendly map viewer, all supported by a comprehensive metadata catalog. Oh, I know what you're thinking. Can I trust the data? How reliable is it? Well, eModNet uses EU and international standards. That means you'll find traceable information on everything from the data collection to the quality controlled data and products. You can trust us to deliver the goods. So what are you waiting for? Take a dive into the world of eModNet and experience the wonders of marine data like never before. And with our commitment to supporting the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development, you will become part of a global digital ecosystem. Here at eModNet, we're all about making data truly work so that data is collected once and used many times by many people for many reasons. So say goodbye to endless searches and hello to more time exploring the beautiful ocean depths, coastlines and everything in between. Visit eModNet today and discover the difference we can make for you. Very good. So I hope that so far the presentations and the video just now has given you inspiration to dive into eModNet and explore um, dif the different features and functionalities and the offer as well. Now I'm going to close with just a couple of slides focused on eModNet for the European Research and Innovation. If you can click one more time, please, we can bring up, yes, the text. So as you're probably all very aware eModnet has many ongoing collaborations with the European Marine Research and Innovation Community. Um, yourselves within the projects that you're in are key data providers and, and also collectors of ocean observations and marine monitoring, but also many um, research uh, organizations, institutes uh, and related uh, networks are partners in the eModnet uh, delivering the service, but also as users of eModnet. Um, so there are a lot of different um, collaborations going on in the, the wider eModnet ecosystem. And today we're just going to show you a couple of examples of how eModnet is already being used by European r and um, So if we can go to the next slide, please. So firstly, in terms of eModnet for um, the mission Restore Our Ocean and Waters, uh, eModnet's offer is really very diverse and broad, so it really does address all the three objectives of, of the mission, um, but also the cross-cutting enablers. So, for example, the, um, the key component of the European Ocean and Water Digital System through eModnet's core role in the European Digital Twin Ocean. And so what we're going to do is show you a couple of use cases, one from uh, Horizon Europe project and another from um, the more mission-related funding. So the first, I should say that these two slides have been provided by the projects themselves. So I'm not going to go into detail explaining uh, the project, but they're just used as, as highlights. Uh, we do have a lot of other content from other projects. So thank you all for your contributions. Um, and what we will do is be able to share this information and uh, hopefully work together with all of you to produce uh, use cases that can go on on the central portal of eModNet because we have a database of over 100 of these use cases and we're always looking um, to give uh, visibility and give concrete examples uh, of how um, stakeholders are using eModNet. So the first is the Ecoscope uh, project, which um, uses a, a lot of different thematics of eModNet, including eModNet bathymetry and seabed habitat data uh, for modeling the spatial variability of fishing impacts uh, and also related to marine protected area um okay and then the next one please 
And the next one is from the Remedies Project, which is funded um, through the um, European funding for the mission at Restore Our Ocean and Waters. Um, so this project is uh, related to the Mediterranean uh, Sea Basin Lighthouse and to uh, the Zero Pollution uh, Objective and the uh, Marine Litter. So this is also a connection with, with EMODnet and also EMODnet Chemistry and Data Ingestion. So these are just two examples. I'm, I'm sure there are many more. And when we get to the Q&A, we can always uh, look into those in a bit more detail. Uh, but for now, I think that was my last slide. Yes, just to highlight the, the database, there is a link there. If you'd like to discover more, just go to the solutions part of the portal and discover the, the different use cases in the searchable database uh, and let us know if you'd like to develop uh, one together. So that's the end of the first part of the, the presentations. We're going to now move to a 10 minute Q&A. We're going to use the Slido that I can see already. There are quite a lot of questions uh, coming up. Um, so I'll have a look at the Slido and then also open the floor if other eModnet uh, colleagues that are on the line would also like to address some of these uh, questions. Um, the one on ingestion of the iceberg tra trajectories, if it's okay, we'll move that to the second Q&A because we will be discussing uh, data ingestion, data submissions later on. Um, then let's see, what are the challenges with data ingestion from data generators outside of EEA? Maybe that's something that um, can be addressed during the data ingestion presentations or Q&A um, as well. So the third one, which relates more to the um, features and functionalities of the central portal, is there a tool to easily download multiple data sets, such as all beach monitoring from Italy, in order for data comparison on a specific macro zone? So the map viewer is a common map viewer where you can navigate all the different thematics and all the hundreds of parameters and data layers that exist. Uh, within eModnet, so you can visualize them together, but you can also download multiple data sets. But I would like to see if Connor or others from the eModnet community would like to add um, anything further as, an, as a response. Uh, no, you can go to um, the map viewer and you can, as, as Kate said, you can switch on many different layers and then draw download for that area. But if you want to do bulk download, which I think is what you want to do here, that's also an option. Depending on some of the on on some of the thematics, um, so there are options within, um, say, chemistry or geology or in bathymetry that you can download the whole the complete data product. Um, usually, you'll find the information in the in the product catalog. But if you have any problems, get in touch with us and we'll see what 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 exists. Great, thanks, Connor. So I'm just looking. There are a number of questions which are sort of related to the data submission ingestion questions from about mission projects. How do we get started on uh, submitting data? That will definitely be addressed in the following presentations, um, giving guidelines and, and advice on that. Um, noting that um, the data management plans are still the responsibility of the projects, but data, data ingestion and other data eModnet experts, of course, can provide advice um, on how to curate your data so that it's um, as ready as possible for submission to eModnet. Um, I'll maybe see if eModnet coordinators, other experts have seen a question they'd particularly like to address at this point. There's one question that I might ask Connor to uh, address, which talks about um, links with other databases, repositories, and initiatives. And there's a question about IAEA data. I don't know if it's possible to explain a little bit how eModnet connects with different initiatives, uh, repositories, and how. Okay, so the main um, uh, route for data into our products through into eModnet are through the thematic groups. Um, well, we have built it at eModnet in such a way that it can link to um, any open ge geospatial consortium web standard web service. So if a data um, repository is is publishing OGC web services, we can you can we can easily link to those. Um, and similarly, if they have something like a, an opened up server, we can easily link to those. But we don't do it directly. We go through the thematics because the thematics are building the data products for the map. For the for the eModnet service, if you're interested in looking at data um, 
comparing data in the map viewer to data that you're publishing yourself uh, through a web service, we actually have functionality in the map viewer that allows you to uh, link directly to web services, web mapping services, so that you can see your web services in the map viewer. Uh, it's under the tools section of the map viewer. Very good. Thank you, Connor. I don't see any hands raised. If you would like to make an intervention, please do raise your hand now because we have a couple of minutes more. And in the meantime, I'm going to address, there's one question about uh, different um, open science um, services, uh, if you like. For example, Zenodo, there's a question of, could we have rehosted data from other cloud services, e.g. Zenodo? So Zenodo is a very important open you know, source repository for documentation. And also I know people do um, share their data through there. The important difference is that if you share it with Zenodo, as far as I understand, there is no direct um, automated harvesting by eModnet or other data services. And so it is important to, to also share your data for submission into eModnet because the added value of that is it becomes integrated and standardized into these pan-European um, and, and basin scale uh, data layers. And then as Connor mentioned, the eModnet services are now interoperable with global initiatives so that they're now harvested by um, the ODIS of IOC UNESCO of IOGE and also GEOS and others. So it really increases the impact and the uptake of your data. And the metadata describes and acknowledges the um, the project and the initiatives as well that have collected or curated the data. So there is a um, a way to to acknowledge um, yourselves as as data collectors or providers. Um, let me see if there are any hands raised. Okay, so for the other questions, they're all very pertinent questions, and it's something that. Um, I believe we can address in the second section of Q&A because a lot of it relates to um, the different types of parameters that could be included in eModnet and data ingestion uh, specific questions. So I suggest uh, in the interest of time, we move forward now, but we will hopefully have um, the full 10 minutes, if not more, for the second Q&A. So I'm going to pass the floor now to um, data ingestion colleagues. So first of all, to Sissy Iona, uh, please, you have the floor. Thank you, Kate. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Kate. So good morning all, uh, and uh, thank you for joining this webinar today. Uh, in the next minutes, I will give an overview of the ingest, eModnet ingestion service and our uh, submission uh, process. Uh, next slide, please. Um, before starting, starting with the overview, I would like to, uh, to say a few words uh, wh why we need uh, such a streamlined flow and gestion uh, process for marine data. Um, first of all, we all know that uh, sound and accessible data are uh, very important for good research, uh, good results from this research, and also to support European ocean policies, initiatives, and agendas. Uh, we also know that the marine data collections cost a lot. Uh, based on previous, uh, on past uh, European reports, it's about 1 billion euros uh, per year for in situ data and about uh, half a billion of euros for remote sensing data. Uh, today, there are many infrastructures in place, such as CDATANET, uh, Eurobis, uh, IGD, ICS, CMEMS, and others, uh, who are connected to EDMOTNET and uh, make marine data uh, discoverable, accessible, and reusable. Uh, but still, there are a lot of valuable marine data uh, that do not arrive in the above mentioned infrastructures, and this prevents their distribution through EDMOTNET and uh, limit uh, their use by the potential users. Next slide, please. Uh, so, EDMOTNET, in order to, to address this uh, challenge, initiated in 2016 the ingestion service. And today, after seven years of a very successful operation, it is a key pillar of EDMOTNET for sharing uh, marine data. Uh, the aim of ingestion is to facilitate the data flow and the ingestion projects from process from uh, data holders uh, to the leading uh, marine data infrastructures I mentioned before, uh, which infrastructures are feeding EDMOTNET for making their data open and fair. So how we do that? 
we do that by uh, identifying uh, new data holders who uh, either are not connected uh, to their national uh, focal points that are uh, contributed data to uh, these infrastructures and ITMOTNET, or quite often these uh, data holders are unaware of how to connect. Uh, also, we motivate and support these data holders to, to become partners of these uh, infrastructures for data exchange and sharing the data with ITMOTNET. Uh, also, we train them uh, to use standards and best practices because this makes easier uh, and faster the integration of their data into ITMOTNET and all these infrastructures I mentioned before. And also, we cooperate with uh, several uh, projects European programs, initiatives. Uh, you will see some examples uh, in the next uh, presentations. And finally, we organize uh, several promotion activities, webinars, workshops, etc., for raising awareness about uh, the ITMOTNET uh, ingestion offer. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, this is uh, our consortium, the Ingestion uh, Consortium, uh, ambassadors of ITMOTNET. Uh, the network consists of uh, 50 data centers and uh, specialized uh, marine centers, and also all ITMOTNET thematic coordinators, and all together promote ITMOTNET, interact with the data providers from multiple sectors, and support them, uh, and at the same time ensure that ITMOTNET provides trustable data and uh, products. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so how we how ingestion works. Uh, in this uh, diagram, you see our uh, principal workflow and the pathways from the data source uh, toward ITMOTNET. Um, it's important to mention here that the submitted data sets uh, are not ingested at directly uh, from the submission service uh, into the ITMOTNET, into ITMOTNET, but first they pass through experienced and qualified data centers who first elaborate them, standardize them, homogenize them, and they integrate into national, regional, and uh, leading European uh, infrastructures, which are feeding uh, ITMOTNET. And if the quality does, of the data does not meet, meet specific requirements, we do not further uh, push them towards uh, ITMOTNET. Uh, and in all this process, use is made of uh, um, standards and best practices, as I mentioned before, in order to make this data as fair as possible. Um, uh, also, to, to mention here that the ingestion service uh, will be, oper which is fully operational since 2017, uh, will be migrated to the central portal as the rest of the uh, thematic uh, portals uh, with the same interface and uh, with a new interface, but with the same uh, functionalities. And this will be done in 2024, this year. Uh, next slide, please. Um, in order to make the submission process as simple as possible, uh, we we follow a step-by-step -step approach. So how we do that? We split the submission into phases. In the phase one, we publish the initial data as is. And in the second phase, phase two, we uh, uh, appropriate data centers who took over the uh, submitted data packages, further elaborate, if it is possible, of course, and integrate the data sets or subsets of them into uh, the uh, national European infrastructures and ITMOTNET. Um, uh, in this uh, screenshot, you can see the uh, submission forms, the submission form, the online submission form, which uses several ISO and Inspire compliant metadata, and also make extended use of vocabularies for parameters, platforms, instruments, formats, etc. Um, it's very important. Important here to notice that the ownership of the data is transparent and clear throughout uh, the process, uh, and this uh, gives uh, proper and proper acknowledgments and credits to the originate to the originated organiza organizations. Uh, and how this is done? This is done by by tagging by labeling uh, project, query summary reports, organizations, uh, and also uh, we can give acknowledgments and credits to the people, to the scientists uh, who originate, who generate the data, because the use, uh, the used DOIs by the system for data sets uh, usually are connected with personal identifiers for people, such as ORCID, for example, so uh, you can uh, get the appropriate uh, acknowledgement and credits uh, when you 
submit your data to Edmodnet through the ingestion uh, service. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is the online service, another very important uh, service that we maintain and operate, uh, where we publish the submitted data sets and one can uh, search and the users can search, view and download the data of their interests. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we have established uh, automatic exchanges with other data repositories in order to make more data available through Edmodnet. Uh, uh, such a very important collaboration is the uh, coupling with the CDataNet uh, Sinoe data site and service, uh, because uh, when scientists uh, submit their data to Sinoe, they can get a DOI, and therefore, as I explained before, scientists can get credits and acknowledgement every time the data sets or the derived Edmodnet products are used. Today, we have more than 300 Sinoi uh, scientific uh, submissions in Edmodnet, and around uh, 250 of them are already published. And uh, we are almost finished with a similar uh, development with uh, an automatic exchange, a semi-automatic exchange with a Crown and State Marine Data Exchange from UK, which deals for uh, with uh, uh, data from the offshore renewable energy sector. Next slide, please. Uh, and I will finish with this one. I will just give you an overview of our results of. Uh, of Operation, operational, uh, uh, operation of all this year. Uh, as you can see on the uh, on the left diagram, since uh, the beginning of the operation in 2017, we have a steady increase uh, of the submissions, uh, and there is a potential for even larger growth through the ongoing and uh, future collaborations that we have. Uh, and uh, these uh, submissions, around more than 1,500 submissions, uh, are coming from from about uh, 200 organizations, as we can, we can see in the diagram on the uh, right top uh, chart pie. Uh, and these uh, organizations are coming from multiple sectors, academic, governmental, business and private, NGOs and uh, citizen science uh, uh, sectors. And, um, the data that uh, these submissions are covered uh, are from uh, multiple disciplines, physics, chemistry, biology, actually all the Edmodnet uh, data themes. You can show this uh, distribution per theme in the lower part of the uh, of this uh, slide. So this was my last presentation. Thank you very much. And if there are any questions we can address in the rest of the meeting. Thank you very much, Sissy. So you've addressed, I think, the question that had come up in the Slido on uh, how do we get a DOI for the data within Emodnet through the the exchange that you have with the Scenery and CDataNet. Um, and there are plenty other questions we can bring into the Q&A. Now we're going to move straight to the second uh, Emodnet data ingestion presentation by Dick Scarp. Uh, so please, Dick, the floor is yours. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we yep. do. Okay. 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 I would like to present something about the guidelines for data submission because you have seen, uh, say, the mechanism. I would like to go a little bit deeper into the community practices. Uh, next slide, please. First of all, um, yeah, we showed you this before, but this is, let's say, the central portal. And what you can see that we have several thematic groups. And each of these groups, let's say, they are experts and they make products and services, which uh, which are available for you uh, as a free and, uh, and also all in a standard way. Um, and, and that, of course, means that uh, there's a lot of expertise there, but they also need a lot of data to be able to make those products. And that also means it was a little bit explained already that we have some sort of pipelines to get, say, to get the data in, in the same format for each of the groups so that those groups can work on those data to make the best products. And also they can renew those products because there are, let's say, production uh, product cycles that every time there is new products or releases and then they are being published through the central portal underpinned by additional data. Next slide, please. Uh, and that, that means that, uh, as Sissy also explained, let's say Ebonet works together with already established uh, marine data infrastructures in Europe, like like CDataNet, which is a network of all the national oceanographic data centers. Uh, there's also Eurobis, which is uh, specialized in, in uh, biodiversity data and biology data. And later, also our colleague Joanna will tell a little bit more about that. There's ACTI, which is the geological data information system where all the geological services in uh, Europe are uh, part of. There's ISIS, which of course is a well-established uh, international organization, uh, which is supporting, uh, say, the also policy and uh, quota on fish 
cash, etc. And uh, and all these, uh, in fact, these infrastructures, they also have already uh, nodes in Europe. I said there are many institutes who are members or nodes in in those uh, those infrastructures. And these infrastructures, they they use certain standards and procedures by which they can harvest or can bring together, let's say, data and and metadata and make it more standardized. And in this way, let's say they have common procedures, and that means, in fact, that for data to be added to Abernet products, it has to follow those procedures which are in place and which can, of course, can be enriched over time because there is always uh, new data coming, new data types, there are new IDs, there are new vocabularies coming or enriched vocabularies. So in this way, I say we, we, we have some established pipelines. And right now we have uh, more than a thousand data originates from public research and also private sector that are using those pipelines to bring the data and make it available to the thematic groups that then use that to make those products and services. Next slide, please. Uh, if you look at the value of Ebonet, uh, Kate already mentioned part of this, because first of all, of course, Ebonet provides a very rich uh, treasure box of uh, marine data and marine data products. And that can be used in uh, in many uh, research and innovation projects immediately, because it gives you a better understanding of the ocean environment, the ocean applications, uh, etc. Um, there are many use cases. They are on the you can find them on the Ebonet portal. And it gives you ideas how things can be used. Um, but on the other side, let's say is what what Zoe mentioned. Let's say there are projects. Uh, they are being funded by the commission. And in the terms of reference, it says, in fact, that you have a contractual obligation to make foreground data openly available. And that means, uh, and also the EU, they streamline, they want to streamline this through Amodnet as the as its in situ data service, because that, that is a very, let's say, a very good portal and platform and podium. And this way it can also be shared, of course, with Copernicus and also with other uh, applications. Um, and therefore, let's say it is uh, very important that, uh, that the research and information projects, they start working on making that data compliant to fairness principles, first of all, but also because otherwise they are not fit, in fact, for use in Ebonet. And also, let's say they can make use of Ebonet then, then to reach out those goals, which are mentioned. And also they can get then a wider recognition because acknowledgement in the Ebonet products is, uh, is guaranteed. That's what, what Sissi explained. And also your data can reach out to a lot, much larger audience than if you only do it on your own project website, which uh, let's say it was the, in the old case, we, we were focusing more only on our projects. Um, and this means that your data becomes uh, yeah, more wider available. It also can uh, be used for the, the digital twin of the ocean or the whole set of these projects. And also, of course, for the global UN uh, ocean decade uh, work. And that's, uh, and that's very important. That's the big value for you as a, as a project. Next slide, please. We, uh, we have the FAIR principles. I don't want to go too deep in this, but because a lot of you, they are already aware of this, of course, but the principles are that uh, your, your data must be findable. So it must be easy to find them by different mechanisms and also by machines, not only by humans. And to, to be, make it available by machines, it means that we have to adopt to standards. Uh, the data must be accessible. So you can, by internet, you must be able to download it and uh, load it immediately. Also we can buy machines into other applications. It must be interoperable. It means that you really have to follow standards and you have to adopt certain formats. You have to adopt vocabularies, more and more vocabularies, because these are machine readable. And also you can also they can be used, let's say, in, in multiple languages. It doesn't matter. It's the same term. And also we use more and more identifiers, let's say persistent identifiers to, 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 uh, to make this linked data model work so that things can be linked to each other and also are persistently in time uh, are available. And that brings us to the last one, which is reusable. It means that you have a lot of provenance information about processes that were undertaken, let's say to make certain data or certain products. And also the license must be well uh, understood and well uh, presented, published to make it work. And FAIR is uh, quite a, a school in Europe, I would say, since uh, many years. And uh, more and more also assessment tools are becoming available. But what we do from the start, let's say with Ebonet, we, we also in those infrastructures that are underneath Ebonet, let's say we are very much on this track and we, uh, we have uh, great results by using common standards and, uh, and procedures. Um, next slide, please. Next slide, sorry. Yeah, then to this uh, part, let's say what what are in general marine data management guidelines? Because there's of course a very wide variety of data and uh, measurements and instruments. And like you say, uh, new, new types of data, new instruments are also evolving over time. So there's a lot of innovation in this domain. 
And it means that there is not one simple rule, let's say, to say you have to follow this, but there are many ways. But one, you can say, at least for metadata, you could, for data in situ data, you can follow the same principles. And it means that the metadata itself, it must provide enough information about how the data was collected, but also how it was processed. And also, let's say, uh, any circumstantial information, let's say documentation that can help to have a better understanding of the data, because that makes it more quality rich and better to, uh, in effect, more fair in that sense. Then for all the data types, of course, we need information about where it was collected, uh, when it was collected, how it was collected, how do you refer to your data, like with station numbers and cast numbers, and who collected it, and what has been done to the data, let's say, as a follow-up. Because if you do uh, samples, for instance, of course, those samples, they go to a laboratory, and then there's a lot of, let's say, further processing before you have the data. And also it could be that you have other types of algorithms that you're using to derive the parameters that are then finding your data. And this is a list. It is very, uh, yeah, it follows, of course, the ISO model, but it's also very, very uh, logic and pragmatic. At the same time, you, it's interesting to see that we still collect, get a lot of data from people that are missing several of these, these, uh, these fields. And that means in practice that we cannot do anything more with the data unless it's provided because otherwise let's say people in the long in the let's say in the further chain cannot work with these data if, if those elements are missing next slide please this is for metadata but we also have of course data formats and data formats there is not one data format that we can say there is that can fit fits all uh, depends on the operations it depends on the acquisition systems uh, etc and also, it, it also sometimes depends a little bit on legacy because there are some formats in, uh, let's say, which are very old, but still the, the, all the applications, let's say processing applications, they use that format. That means it's a legacy format, which has to be maintained because it's the de facto standard in a certain domain. Um, that on the other hand, let's say we have, of course, uh, we have quite a list of uh, common practices, which formats to use uh, in combination with the metadata. And, uh, and though that list is uh, published on the ingestion website on this uh, URL. And also when we do the migration, of course, uh, to the new central portal, we will make sure that this, uh, this URL stays uh, active, let's say it be, be supported, simply migrated also to the central portal. And I, I advise you, let's say, to have a, yeah, to have a look at this uh, part and uh, read, because there you see the, the major infrastructures that are underpinning Ableton, and you see what kind of type of formats they are using for specific types of data. And of course, there are always exceptions, and I saw in some of the questions already a lot of exceptions, and it's, it's interesting also to see that people are looking for the exceptions and not for the, for the, the main road. But uh, most of the data we get is, of course, is main main road uh, work. And uh, if they follow those principles, let's say we uh, we are able to to make it onboarded, in fact, and able to make it part of the products that uh, and the groups that are working on those. Next slide, please. Uh, then the recommendations for you that uh, as as projects. Uh, first of all, adopt the community standards, as I say. So have a good read and good understanding. And use this when you are formulating your data management plans, because in your data management plans, that's a requirement, of course, in every project, always in month four, month six, you have to describe uh, how you're going to handle and document your data collection, and also what, what processing steps you will do for long-term preservation accessibility. So let's say following the fairness uh, principles. And uh, if you already then, let's say, take uh, into account, let's say, those community standards and the fact that you want to make use of Ableton as, 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 your, uh, as, your, as one of your targets to, to, uh, to make your data more widely available, then, of course, you can much more direct your data management plan. Uh, secondly, your data management plan, they should be defined, of course, by the goals of your research projects for above all or your observation program. Um, and also your, and then your data should be documented, but then following the metadata, as I just explained, as, as uh, standards that we are using and also supported by the vocabularies that we are using, because then we speak the same language and also the computers can speak the same language. And that's what we are aiming for with fairness. Um, another thing is that what you can do, what you should do is um, when you are designing and implementing your data management plans, uh, take into account that you want to collaborate with with let's say representatives of those data management infrastructures that are underpinning the, the Ableton uh, pipelines. And they have many national nodes, let's say there are many institutes, the major research infrastructures, they are partners and members. 
And that means that uh, a lot of projects already have those institutes also on board. So they have somebody in the house who is working at the data department and can help them in this, this sense. And, and that will, of course, smooth or, uh, yeah, let's say, in, make, make the data flow much more easy, let's say, for you to handle and to deal with those, those community standards because they're known in your own uh, operation. Um, then uh, finally, let's say what we can do is you can also establish contact with Emotnet from the start of the project. And you can, uh, let's say, discuss with us uh, and, and explore more or less, let's say, what's the best data flow and, and how to make the best way use of Emotnet facilities, but also how you can, of course, in the project itself, let's say, uh, can do the best way forward to, to reach your goal. Um, it, it should be mentioned again, let's say, that uh, the responsibility for uh, data, good data management is always uh, let's say in your own project because that's you are doing the project you are responsible but Emonet is there to to uh, now to help and to benefit of course also from your work because by doing that together we are able to get more data and the data can be used to enrich than the products that we are making which then have a, a wider uptake by others who are making good benefit of this next slide please finally so the support what we can give as Emonet ingestion because that uh, is part of the as I've already explained, able ingestion brings together all the thematics. So it's it's a central service. Of course, what Zoe also said, if you already have connections, let's say you already are working together with with other ways to get into Amonet, just uh, let's say ignore this this uh, or uh, do a bypass. Let's let's say like this, not ignore, but uh, do a bypass. Because we want to keep, of course, uh, existing procedures in place, and the uh, image ingestion is is a, is more a way, let's say, for those who are less aware and uh, and they want to learn, or those who want to adopt. So that's uh, that's the way that we are targeting it. Um, first of all, formulate your your data management plans yourself, taking into account uh, your research and data collection plans, but and also considering the community standards that I explained and the practices. Then you can supp seek support from us, let's say, for reviewing your data management plans. In fact, before you are publishing and deploy them, so in, let's say, the certain states of your work, uh, we, we can yeah, have contact with us and we can then see which is the best possible partner in our network, let's say, to, to, uh, to confer with you. And also we can, uh, this way we can do some sort of matchmaking, maybe with a relevant data center that is best fit for, for the job to, to be done uh, to help you. Um, we, we have this large network, with more than 50 ambassadors. They consist of the thematic coordinates, but we also uh, have many members who are in, uh, involved in CData, Eurobis, ACTI, and others. So we have many nodes in European countries. So that there must be a way, let's say, to, to do this matchmaking. And uh, also we have the data submission service itself that you can use, uh, but then only if you already have well-documented data, metadata and data sets, because we, otherwise we cannot bring it further than level one. And we want to bring it to level two, which means acceptance in, in the internet uh, product uh, flow. And finally, we also have, uh, we also are supporting operational data streams, but that will be explained by, by my colleague Antonio. And then there's a, let's say, and again, the disclaimer, you, in the end, you are responsible yourself, of course, for good data management and the fairness, but we can help you. And, and that's, uh, that's also what we are offering. And we hope that we can have a very good cooperation together on this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dick, for that very clear uh, presentation. So, I think a key takeaway as we move forward is that data is nothing without metadata. You've explained very much, uh, Dick, about the, the eModnet has this list of minimum metadata fields. And it's really important if in your project you're going out to collect data that you already get in touch with the data ingestion or check out the portal and all of the information so that when you collect your data, you also collect the information required to make it fair and to make it as ready as possible um, to feed into eModnet. Um, uh, afterwards. And then uh, Dick has mentioned these broader guidelines, which the data ingestion team are preparing. Um, so for those, they will be sent to participants and then shared on the eModnet portal in due course in, the, in a matter of a couple of weeks uh, from now. So please stay tuned for that. Um, I also hope that that presentation clarified a question that we got during the registration process about there were many initiatives collating data how does you know eModnet work with that? Is there a centralized system? I mean, it, it, Dick very much explained how eModnet works with a lot of research infrastructures, data infrastructures, networks like CDataNet that work from the national, regional to European level to make sure that data pipeline of data, in situ data specifically, are coming into eModnet. And that's important because eModnet is the public service 
of the European Commission for in situ data, which then feeds not only European Digital Twin Ocean, but um, you know other initiatives as well. So that, that's the message that there are those interactions, both at geographical levels, but also thematically with different uh, infrastructures and initiatives. But projects should definitely make that link with eModnet to ensure that those data, um, if it's funded by European Union, that it's it's flowing into eModnet. Um, now we're going to uh, move... maybe, maybe maybe one last mention is that of course what you yeah. can see in eModnet that we have products and we have let's say controlled in fact controlled product lines, and that means that we cannot simply let's say use the eModnet portal to to uh, to post let's say other links from other services, but we really want to have the data to become part of those pipelines before they can be used to make the product. And that's a principle that that's a, you know, almost a holy principle. And that's something that we have to, otherwise we cannot guarantee the, the quality anymore of the services, et cetera. That's yep. it. Very good point. Okay, great. So now we're going to move to the final two presentations, which are shorter. They're five minute perspectives from eModnet coordinators. Uh, so I'm going to pass the floor to Antonio Novellino from eModnet Physics first, please. Thank you very much. Good, good morning, everybody. It will be a quick snapshot on one specific uh, topic that we are covering with ingestion that is particularly relevant for uh, immunite physics. Next slide, please. As introduced by Dick, uh, ingestion is also dealing with uh, near real time data. So it's uh, mainly related to operational oceanography, that is, this is a systematic and long term collection of and interpretation of the data of the ocean. And operational oceanography is uh, quite important because it gives the accurate description of the present state of the sea that is used for many crucial applications. We, based on uh, operational oceanography, we can have uh, fast responses to emerging event, events like extreme weather conditions, uh, harm, uh, harmful algal blooms, uh, high tides, uh, the example of Aqua Alta in Venice. But we can also use this data for boundary condition for implementing services in search and rescue application, oil spill application, and so on. But this is also used for vessel routing, uh, plant fishing activities. So we can see that operational geography is quite very important. And most of the operational geographic data are related to ocean physics data, because we can collect uh, operationally in near real time temperature, salinity, currents, waves, rivers also. And uh, operational data flow is a key component in uh, both in modern physics, but also in other European programs initiative, as already mentioned by Kate, we are um, working in tight collaboration with Copernicus Marine Services. So that's why immunity ingestion has designed a dedicated path to manage these near real time data flows. Next slide, please. So similar to the standard flow that has been presented uh, in the previous uh, uh, presentation, the near real time uh, uh, ingestion is organized in two phases uh, in order to manage the full uh, life cycle of the submission. We have a phase one that is from data to publishing uh, the subset as a, a package as, uh, as is. And then we have a further elaboration of the, this data set of this uh, um, interoperability services in order to be integrated uh, as a full package or a subset in operational repositories. And of course, if the, uh, the stream is uh, eligible, the ingestion process uh, continues with the standard part in order to secure the long-term stewardship as uh, Dick mentioned uh, before. This uh, methodology applies to fixed station, autonomous vehicles, drifting loads, smart sense of vessel, everything that can really collect the data that we mentioned before. And the process uh, consists in some steps in action. For example, we start with a conduct that can, we can be uh, involved in uh, conducting the help desk service uh, by mails, by events. We can meet an event and then we can follow up on, on data. Uh, we do an analysis uh, because we need to understand which parameter, because of course uh, we are not covering all the parameters, but we can support uh, an understanding which is the best uh, workflow. Uh, we have to analyze the format metadata. We have to check the APIs because we are speaking about an operational service. And then of course, as I already mentioned, we have to work on the harmonization of the metadata in order to make the service ready for the ingestion. Uh, and this is supported by several tools because within the community, we have developed uh, controlled uh, vocabulary services. Uh, we have tools in order to uh, play with the APIs and translate some of the API services. Uh, 
as well as uh, we have uh, ready made available some tools for newcomers to speed up and facilitate the process. I'm mentioning AirDAP uh, because we implemented a Docker that can be easily downloaded and deployed. And as I already mentioned before, AirDAP is an open source uh, tool project. It, it is implementing the file concept. It is endorsed by the Global Ocean uh, Observing System. It helps in implementing full federation so we can implement the streaming of data without making copies. And it, it is becoming a standard de facto for uh, managing the data. Next slide, please. So here uh, I'm going to present a couple of use cases uh, that show how, um, I mean, this process can be implemented. Uh, this is a project, Nautilus, a new approach to underwater technologies for innovative low-cost ocean observation that has a goal uh, to fill gaps in marine observation and modeling gaps uh, by developing a new generation of cost-effective sensors and, and samplers. And among the others, Nautilus is developing new sensors to be used by fishing vessels during fishing activities. Nautilus designed a data infrastructure that included uh, the uh, a modern AirDAP Docker, for example. And uh, when they started working on this, we helped them and we guided them along the uh, Imodernet uh, metadata and standards. And now that they are in the demonstration phase, we can see their data that are flowing in near real time. Next slide, please. Yes, and please, Antonio, uh, this is the last yes, slide, I believe. Uh, this Thanks. is very fast because this is another example. This is a more recent project because it's a European mission ocean lighthouse project that is implementing uh, the uh, low uh, multi-use low trophic aquaculture uh, demonstration. The end, uh, although this project is in, in its very preliminary phase, um, they are doing some characterization of this, uh, the sites. And thanks to the adopted data management infrastructure, again, AirDAP and some immodern metadata, the new in situ data are already flowing in, uh, into the, their data system and that is connected to Immunet. And so we can already see this data in the central system. Though, and this is a very good outcome from the project for the activity that we have described before. Great, thank you very much, Antonio, for highlighting another type of data stream, the near real time, which is increasingly used, I would say, um, not only in uh, operational research infrastructures, but also projects. So very interesting to see that. Um, so get in touch with Antonio for more information. And then now we go to Joanna Beja, uh, who's the coordinator of Imodnet Biology. Hello, good morning, everyone. I have two slides. <laughs> Just to uh, give you a bit of information of um, the workflow that we have for some of the EU funded projects that have started to contact us to uh, deliver data. So if you can go to the next or I don't know, next. <laughs> yes. Okay. So um, to start with, uh, I would just like to say that we are uh, available uh, to provide you any support or answer any questions you have regarding biodiversity data. Our email is bio at imonet.eu. So if you just use that, one of the colleagues uh, in the data management team will get back to you. Um, I have a, a very simple uh, diagram just to show you how the, the workflow uh, uh, is. So basically you have your project data, you might have it deposited in a repository uh, according to your DMP, of course. So I'm not uh, including here um, the, 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 exp or the flow coming from ingestion. So this is for uh, if you have a DMP and you have uh, specified that your data will be hosted uh, in a specific uh, repository. So what will need to happen is that with con by contacting us, of course, and we provide uh, some of that support, um, you will um, you or the, the repository, whoever within the project is uh, allocated to that uh, work, um, can use uh, the GBIFS integrated publishing toolkit, which allows for the publication of the biodiversity data in a standardized format that is used within the community. We harvest the data from that instance, and once the data are published in our uh, in in the central portal, it, it is also shared with OBIS, GBIF, and it will become available in the EU DTO via the Editor Infra Data Lake. Um, on next slide, please. 
Uh, yes. So uh, in terms of support, things that we can do is that we can host your IPT instance or you can upload your data to our IPT. So either way, depending on how much technical capacity you have, you can choose either option. Um, you can also host your IPT, of course, but then you have to maintain it. So if it's a, a kind of one off or for just one project, it might not be worth it. Um, we have a free self-paced training course, um, which uh, you can access. It's in, in the Ocean Teacher uh, platform. And basically, it takes you through uh, all the procedures that you need to do on the data before uh, you submit it to Imanet Biology and then uh, published by us. Um, we are working as well in uh, guidance to publish uh, genomics data. And we have some guidance if your one of your outputs is uh, data products. We have guidance on how to create uh, the output files in NetCDF, as that's you know easier to work with in in systems like Erdap, uh, so that we can integrate it in the central portal as well. Um, we have uh, they, so those are all links, but the, they are also available through the ImodNet uh, portal. Uh, in the biology theme, uh, we have, if you work with Excel, because a lot of the biologists do work with Excel files, we have a data file template that you can use as well to, to work up your data. And we have a tool that allows for a quality check, and that's uh, available as an R package or an R Shiny application, which is in on a web browser. You upload your IPT resource, which is just the URL, and it reads the data, the information, and it identifies any issues that you might have. So it's it's a bit condensed. Uh, if you do have biodiversity data, um, do contact us, and we'll see what how we can work together to make the data available um, in the Imonet portal. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joanna. So highlighting really the data flows and pathways, as you said, from specifically Imonet Biology and for any questions on uh, the data flows, I really encourage you to reach out um, as soon as possible at the beginning of projects, but, but whatever stage you're at in your project to the data ingestion uh, and the secretariat, we can then uh, put you in touch with the relevant thematic if you don't have uh, a particular connection already, or of course, if there are partners involved in your project that um, are within the different email net thematics, you'll already have um, a very good uh, route in um, there. So we're just about to start the final Q&A. So please, if you do have final questions, post those in Slido or raise your hand. Um, we're just gonna also enable the video and if it's possible just to go back um, to stop sharing screen actually, just for a minute, because we'd like to enable everybody's video and take a screenshot for those who are happy to turn on their videos so that we can use this screenshot for um, social media promotion about the webinar today. So it's great to see all of your faces coming on. Fantastic. So I'll give it one more minute for people to turn on their video. And then uh, my colleague Angelica, I think will take a screenshot of as many of us as possible. Then, beautiful. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, then I'll mention it now in case I forget that tomorrow we send out our monthly newsletter of eModnet. So this goes to thousands of stakeholders that have signed up to receive regular um, updates from eModnet, from the services, thematics, uh, events we do, etc. So if you're interested, we can put the, in the chat the link to sign up to the News Digest. But if you sign up today, you'll already receive the monthly newsletter tomorrow and then monthly thereafter unless you opt out. Um, so that's one way to, to also keep in touch. So now we're going to open the, the questions and answers. I'm going to kick off with, um, there was a question, let me see. Yes, there was a question earlier on about um, the challenges of data ingestion from data generators from outside of the European Union or, or uh, EEA. And I just wondered if anybody from data ingestion or the thematic coordinators or experts on the line would like to give a, a brief response to that. No, I can say something in general, is that we are interested in the global data, see, uh, 
but in fact, mostly collected with European institutions. At least that's it. That's our remit. But we also, of course, we because we have activity of uh, sharing data and uh, exchange data with with the other, uh, let's say, other continents. So let's say with USA and Australia, etc. So we don't want to be in their domain. But of course, European uh, institutions they collect data in uh, all over the world, and we are interested in that data. Great, thanks, Dick. So indeed, uh, eModnet does have some partnerships and interactions with other data services worldwide or different regions, as was just mentioned. In terms of the European seas, because the mandate is uh, first and foremost the high resolution of European seas, this of course includes you know the full sea basin. So for example, in the Mediterranean Sea and Black Sea, there are associated countries that we're very interested to talk with and to see about data sharing or um, aligning together so that we can give the best um, offer possible, um, but also vice versa to see how eModnet could be um, harvested if, if it's useful by other um, services um, in different regions. So if you're interested in that dialogue, please do, do get in touch with that as well. Um, then I'm going to just pass the microphone again back to Sissy, Dick, um, Antonio, Joanna, if there were any questions you'd seen or any further clarifications you would like to address first. Maybe I could, uh, I, I already put uh, an answer, a short answer to the slide or a screen uh, for the radioactivity data, just to say that uh, we can handle radioactivity data in the water column can be handled as any other data type in the water column. And you can search the CDataNet uh, uh, portal to see some specific uh, examples, the format that uh, uh, can be used, uh, the parameters, uh, how the parameters, the units can be described, if it's profile, if it is a time series, so you can see all this in the CDNet. And of course, if you need some more uh, assistance to reformat and uh, standardize uh, your data, you can contact us. I hope this answers your question about radioactivity data. In CDNet, I think there are examples from Black Sea and the GNC. So I think you can have a, you can get a good idea from there. Thank you very much, Sissy. And that naturally links to a number of other questions, actually, that were regarding the eModnet offer in terms of different parameters, thematic areas. So you've just addressed the marine radioactivity data, but I can just mention, um, we don't have time to go through each one, but in terms of the paleo data um, question, geology experts reacted to say this is more than likely relevant to their thematic. So absolutely get in touch if you have uh, Paleo oceanography or other related data that, that you're interested in submitting. And then the question on river and river basin data, eModnet physics have reacted um, that yes, eModnet physics and eModnet in general is interested in bringing in in situ data from um, more inland waters. It's not the primary mandate of eModnet, but increasingly because we're serving the mission restore our ocean and waters, we want to enable the, the marine knowledge base, not only for the seas, but also the inland waters. So there are um, some in situ river outflow data already in eModnet, but they're looking to expand that. So please do get in touch. Um, and then there was a question on iceberg trajectories as well. So if possible for eModnet experts to reply in the Slido, that would be fantastic. But what we can do is grab all of these questions and the ones that you put into the survey when you registered and we can send around a Q&A um, answer sheet uh, in the next couple of weeks to give you some brief responses to each of your questions. Um, and the question on overseas regions and territories, absolutely the data also not only from um, the European nations, but their overseas regions and territories, of course, are absolutely relevant to eModnet. So please do get in touch. I can see one hand raised. So Charlotte, uh, don't please, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Kate. Um, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I was uh, just uh, I just wanted to elaborate a little bit on the riverine data um, because the riverine data is not it's not possible to include that yet in Emotnet chemistry. Uh, but I was wondering if we could submit the data to Emotnet data ingestion um, and then see um, whether there is a part of uh, that data that can flow through to uh, eModnet chemistry or maybe in the future? Um, or is that not really um, something uh, that we should do uh, with the riverine data of Inspire? Mm -hmm. For this, I'll see if uh, Dick or Sissy would like to respond. No, I think it's uh, possible as a use uh, ingestion because then at least I say we have level one. 
and then we can see with chemistry if we can elaborate data because the difficulty is of course the water framework and also inland waters let's say the we had a discussion about this in fact uh, recently in Amonet chemistry is that uh, they have different uh, i call it different uh, ranges etc so it's uh, so we are more tuned on on the sea but of course uh, as uh, Kate also was saying, let's say we more and more we uh, look at also at the input, let's say from rivers into the seas because they are an important factor, and therefore also in chemistry we are going slowly more and more also getting to uh, to inland waters, let's say at least the last part to have uh, let's say the the data there, and we work together then also with physics because they also have inland stations, so it's uh, so so. I think follow this route for the time being. Let's say go to ingestion and then uh, make the data available there, and then we can see how we can pick it up and bring it further. And also we can have, of course, later have a discussion, as we said, uh, your, the door is open for some discussion uh, a little bit deeper. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we were planning to uh, already use uh, vocabularies, etc., uh, that were mentioned in uh, Immanuel Chemistry as well. So thank you. Yeah, and also very those good. vocabularies uh, is also very good to say the vocabularies are being managed. And that means that if there are terms missing, then you can make proposals for ad additional terms. And uh, that's the way with the very living vocabularies because we uh, they are extending all the time because there are new types of data, but also new groups that, that pick them up and then they bring their own vocabulary into it in, in a standardized way then available to the whole world, more or less. That's uh, how it works with web services and uh, and RDF and all the, let's say, all the different technologies behind to make them widely adopted in, in machines and by persons. Thank you. Very good. Thank you very much for your question. So just to wrap up now, I mean, in the chat, we've put the link to the newsletter that you can subscribe. We've also put the help desk uh, emodnet email, email address. Now this goes centrally into emodnet. It's logged in our JIRA system. So it's um, any uh, request that goes in there um, the secretariat and the coordinators, the technical experts of eModnet can see this. We can then navigate to the best person, the best expert to answer your query. So please don't hesitate to contact that. If you do have uh, questions, please do um, look at the service and discover what it could do for you. And if you have suggestions as well on the evolution of the service, please do let us know. We're always interested in knowing what, what users um, need uh, in their emerging work. Um, so we're now going to pass to uh, Zoe Konstantinou from DG Mari for some closing words. Thank you, Kate. And uh, thank you all for your presentations and for the very interesting questions that were put forward. Um, I, I hope that we will have the opportunity in the future to to do this very interesting uh, workshop and also uh, after this workshop to evaluate uh, how this has worked uh, in order to bring in data from European projects. Uh, I hope that this uh, opening today, uh, besides the current projects that we have around the virtual table, uh, will also uh, be uh, transferred as a message uh, to to other colleagues that are working in marine research and innovation in, in Europe and uh, with the greater goal that at some point uh, uh, whatever is uh, collected in terms of marine in situ data ends up uh, harmonized and standardized in one point and is accessible to all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Zoe. So now, just before we close, I'd like to take a little bit look forward uh, in the sense that next week, many of you may be coming to Brussels for the European Ocean Days. There will be a number of eModnet experts participating in the full week of events. So this is covering um, the Mission Restore Our Ocean and Waters Forum and the related matchmaking, parliament events, foresight workshops, Blue Invest uh, and Ocean Literacy. Uh, so if you do want to get in touch um, there or connect, just, just let us know. And before that, we actually have tomorrow another webinar that Data Ingestion have organised, which is really looking at data management for offshore licence procedures. So if you're interested in that, I would suggest you can email us at the Secretariat, but I would suggest uh, Dick and Sissy, maybe you would put um, the email address you would prefer registrations come or expressions of interest come into you. Uh, for that. Uh, there's also an article on our eModnet portal that explains that webinar in more detail. And then just stay tuned in terms of um, 
later in the year, the eModnet community have kicked off um, a vision document, a vision 2035, where we're really going to be consulting with the wider community on the services of eModnet, the service evolution, what types of parameters, you know, in terms of seas to inland waters, in terms of parameters, geography, resolution, etc. Um, so we will be putting out some public consultation late in the spring or early summer. So please stay tuned for that. And we hope this has been very informative. We hope to be in touch and um, together to work towards a more um, connected and consolidated marine knowledge uh, in Europe. So I'd just like to finish by thanking all the people that made this webinar happen. So Megan and Angelica, if you could put your video on, I'd like to thank my two colleagues, Megan and Angelica, for all the organization, all the experts that spoke today from data ingestion, uh, physics, biology, and secretariat, all the other eModnet experts that joined. I think I saw geology and seabed habitats, and there's probably more, um, and also DG Mari and Sinea for the collaboration. So thank you very much. And, uh, it will be share all the presentations by the portal. Yes, Thank indeed, you. there Thank will you. be there will be an article on the uh, portal about this webinar that will go into our news digest tomorrow. We can make the individual presentations available and the recording will follow as well. And then the guidelines that Dick has mentioned, that will be more in a couple of weeks time. So look out for the, the March newsletter for information on that. And it will also be sent to you as participants uh, that registered. So thank you very much.